Okay, Hadi. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Welcome to the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 25th of March, 2021. We wish you all are having good time again, wherever you are. Sebastian and myself are delighted to host you again this week with another exciting, informative, and engaging geoscientific and geoenergetic talk. Uh, the channel has already reached 2,000 subscribers, and we aim for more uh, geosciences to connect through this open science channel across uh, the borders everywhere on this uh, beautiful planet Earth. Uh, today, we have the pleasure and honor to host our dear colleague Birendra Yaha from the University of Southern California. Uh, Birendra is Assistant Professor of Petroleum Engineering and leading the lab, GEM Lab, at USC. Uh, I'll also try to send a link of his lab to you in the chat box so you go and access his team as well and get in touch with, with him. Uh, he conducts and leads research, lead research in computational geomechanics to model induced seismicity, hydraulic fracturing, CO2 sequestration, and groundwater remediation in stress-sensitive rocks. Quite a broad range of uh, applications his fundamental science uh, work and focus is covering. His research has been funded by a, a variety of uh, funding agencies, ranging from US Department of Energy, National Science Foundation in US, American Chemical Society, and energy companies, obviously. Birendra received his master's and PhD from Stanford University and MIT, respectively. He has won a number of awards, uh, including National Science Foundation Hydrologic Sciences in 2020. Also, he got SPE, Society of Petroleum Engineers, Distinguished Achievement Award for Petroleum Engineering Faculty uh, in 2020, quite a prestigious award. And he also received American Chemical Society Petroleum Research Fund in 2017, the Rose Hills Research Fellowship, again in the same year, 2017, and also importantly, Best Doctoral Thesis Award of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering of MIT at, uh, in 2014. He also has received an AGU award again in 2010, uh, Best Outstanding Student Paper Award uh, for two years, 2009 and 10, and also a fellowship award, uh, Hotler, with my pronunciation, Fellowship Award at MIT um, from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, Occidental Oil and Gas Company also has offered him an award for leading with an original development strategy in 2008, and also Shalambajit Top Contributor Award was given to him uh, for Knowledge in Action in 2003. Uh, please do visit his Google Scholar page and, and uh, find his uh, important, impactful uh, research, mainly on the subject of geomechanics for a wide application of geosciences that we know of. Uh, and, uh, I'm going to just submit the link of his research lab also at USC to you all to get uh, in touch with him and his team. Uh, thank you very much, Birendra, for accepting our invitation uh, graciously and making yourself available uh, at about 7 a.m. in California. Uh, to the audience, please note his lecture would last for about half an hour, 30 minutes, followed by questions and discussions, like always. Sebastian will chair the discussion session. Do post your questions in the chat box whenever appropriate. It would trigger other questions by the uh, audience as well. So we look forward to have also a lively and engaging uh, discussion session afterwards as well. So once more, thank you very much, Birendra. Please, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Hadi. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. I'm really happy to be here uh, to get the opportunity to, to give a seminar uh, to this audience. Fortunately, the, because of the time zone, uh, it's 8 a.m., uh, so one extra hour of uh, sleep or rest, uh, you can say. So, so it's good. Sorry, we, you are in time saving. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so we are eight time. hours of difference. Yeah. So, so as uh, Hadi introduced, uh, uh, mentioned in his introduction, I'm going to talk about computational geomechanics and in particular computational geomechanics of induced 
seismicity which is a broad topic i will include uh, actually i will emphasize more a seismic deformation and deformation prior to seismicity the actual seismicity event itself uh, then the the investigation of seismic uh, uh, the seism seismicity so let's go ahead with that just one more comment very important here is that I will be presenting work of uh, my students Min Tran and Shaoxi Zhao. Shaoxi Shaoxi just graduated few months ago, uh, so so she now she's working for LinkedIn. So a big change uh, in her career, but she is very she has been very productive, and uh, I'll be showing her work. Swamik Dana is a recent postdoc in our group, and you may have heard his uh, talk a few weeks ago. and i'll be showing some of uh, his work also okay so without going into the definitions of uh, these topics uh, because i'm assuming you are familiar with this uh, i'll just say that induced seismicity induced earthquakes uh, has been in the news popular news popular science for many years uh, in last over the last 10 years it has been in the news many times uh, basically this is a schematic that i show it clearly conveys the general idea you know you when you inject in the deep sub surface where you have these uh, critically stressed ready to slip faults you know you can pressurize them lubricate them uh, or sub via some other mechanism make them fail uh, causing earthquakes on the ground surface that humans can feel uh, similarly when you extract fluids Uh, during oil and gas production or just groundwater extraction for for water uh, municipal water use you can also lead to stress changes in the subsurface which can then uh, make a nearby fault uh, slip so that's basically the idea induced earthquakes you know flow induced earthquakes anthropogenically induced earthquakes or human induced uh, earthquakes this is another actually mechanism where you are uh, loading the earth by creating a dam a water reservoir or dam on the surface and the extra load that you apply by filling the dam can actually activate the fault and some people believe uh, the 2008 uh, wenchuan earthquake which was magnitude 8 and, and higher was caused by building of a dam and very rapid filling of the dam over 6 months anyway so for energy applications uh, these are the common areas uh, common uh, operations which have been tied to induced earthquakes you know wastewater disposal where the wastewater can come from oil and gas activities co2 sequestration which is a long term injection uh, operation oil gas or water production as i mentioned underground gas storage which is a common uh, operation in europe uh, as far as i know Uh, to 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 cycle between winter and summer months uh, the the natural gas you know when there is high demand in winter you produce when there is less low demand you inject and store in the ground so that can also lead to deformation and uh, earthquakes and hydraulic fracturing in some rare cases uh, i'm aware of one in canada but there are one there are some other cases where hydraulic fracturing itself has caused uh, felt earthquakes um around the world okay here this slide a busy slide basically showing a montage of uh, recent publications in fact this is not that recent anymore i built this 5 uh, 6 4 5 years ago uh but you can see still get an idea about uh, how and how much it was in the news and still continue to do so and uh, the geographic locations where uh, these events have been noted these are all uh, papers from high impact factor journals so quite reliable and good good uh, good work by our uh, community in computational geomechanics this one here a uh, central figure from uh, william elsper's paper in 2013 shows how in us uh, number of earthquakes increased rapidly almost super exponentially from 2005 and then 10 onwards and then he tied them to induced earthquakes because of their proximity to injection wells and um 
distance from flood boundaries, right, which where where natural earthquakes are, are likely to occur. So I'll just go through this quickly. Okay, now this was this slide that I made yesterday. Basically, I'm trying to convey here is that over the last decade, people who do induced seismicity studies uh, based on models, uh, like like me myself. Uh, for us, the models have advanced from simple to complex, complex to gain uh, some additional benefits which were not possible with the simple models. And here is a list that I could come up with. So it's not exhaustive, not an exhaustive list. Um, and it's not even super clear, but I'll just try to mention a few things here. So, you know, early on, we were relying heavily on single phase pressure diffusion model, get the pressure and use a one way coupled approach to calculate stress and deformation. Later, we moved to complex models where we have two-way coupling. You know, we actually solve for flow and mechanics equations simultaneously or sequentially, but we solve them to get more accurate stresses and pressure and stress-dependent properties like probability, which was not possible with simple models like this. Then single-phase flow to multi-phase flow was required to model multi-phase systems, right? Oil and gas fields, unconfined aquifers where you where production of extraction of water leads to uh, entry of air into the aquifer because it's unconfined, right? So you have at least two phase problem here. Simple uh, models uh, use Coulomb failure stress, which is basically a post processing of uh, <clears throat> this one way coupled model, for example, was uh, superseded by complex models where you actually use false dynamic false slip with uh, realistic rheology like slip weakening and rate and state friction which can give you realistic real world earthquake cycles loading and then relaxation during earthquake then loading again and relaxation it continues so that was not possible with simple models uh, quasi static to quasi dynamic elastodynamic is another uh, step change in modeling uh, induced uh, um, seismicity for the reasons you know listed here we want to get more accurate estimates of the seismic magnitude and in some rare cases uh, capture wave propagation effects for example if one fault slips can it lead to slip on a nearby fault nearby it is it's a relative term you know it happened in us uh, a big earthquake in alaska led to a smaller earthquake in california it's hundreds of thousands of miles but uh, that was a dynamic triggering effect and to capture that you have to have elastodynamics in your mechanics model the linear elastic rocks to you know inelastic uh, rocks uh, elastoplastic viscoplastic is more realistic for uh, sedimentary rocks like shale sandstone carbonates uh, for large effective stresses Cyclic loading, like the UGS operation I mentioned, underground gas storage can lead to this, can require such models. Uh, this one here is interesting that I have started working on, where we couple flow geomechanics with uh, advection diffusion, advection dispersion transport to, to see how this transport, transport behavior, for example, mixing of the solute slug, right, or spreading of the solute, how does that, how is that affected by geomechanics? And if there is a feedback from transport into geomechanics. So I'll show you a case study, the push-pull tracer, tracer test I mentioned in my abstract. Then on the modeling side, of course, we have uh, measures becoming more and more complex to capture realistic uh, sites, realistic uh, uh, faults, geometry and such. And then this one is uh, the, the very recent thing, not not very widespread, you know, using finite strain theory to model some of the events uh, at sites undergoing large subsidence and compaction over decades. So I'll explain this in detail later, uh, right around here actually. So almost all studies assume infinitesimal strain deformation, right? So finite strain is more complex as you will probably get an idea if you haven't uh, uh, seen it before, it's mathematically more complex, more involved. But the point is that it is needed, that complexity is needed in some cases. Cases such as this, if your uh, system is uh, 
is undergoing large deformation because the stresses are large or duration of loading is large or the material itself is very sensitive weak you know uh, such as you know the, the the rocks listed here clay sands shales carbonates then you have no other recourse uh, but uh, to use finite strain models these are real world examples you know subsidence in california central valley uh, which is the primary agricultural uh, valley in uh, in california and for the us actually uh, has been going on for at least 6 7 decades so for those systems you cannot uh, make this assumption of infinitesimal strain uh, because the errors that you in, that you incur uh, increase with time so that's why i keep mentioning this uh, decade long subsidence problems uh, this as i mentioned in the very first slide you know these things are about these things are beyond just seismic uh, deformation they they could be a seismic deformation they could be in the subsurface in the cap rock or in the reservoir itself or on the ground surface in terms of fissures you know fissures are basically cracks that are opening up when uh, you have uh, uh, compaction of uh, or consolidation of your uh, um, deep subsurface reservoirs so this one here is a real world example of uh, such long term uh, uh, subsidence case in spain which actually was culminated by this induced uh, earthquake in 2011 of magnitude 5.6 or 7 i believe the idea the, the mechanism was uh, as follows you know you have this mountain mountainous region and you have this lorca town sitting here this is a vertical cross section and this is the lorca or Guadalentine aquifer, which is unconfined, so open to atmosphere, where extraction was going on for five decades, which led to a drop in water table, which led to a drop in the weight of the rock. Right? When you removed water and replaced it with air, which is much lighter, you decreased the weight of the rock on the basement rock which led to expansion of the basement, right? It is now feeling less weight, so it will expand in all directions. And in this case, it applied compression on this thrust fault, which led to the earthquake. So you can see the, the chain of, chain, chain of uh, events in this case. Here's a subsidence rate from satellite data is very high, 16 centimeter per year. And uh, measured subsidence is two meters uh, plus, but, uh, in the olden days, they didn't even measure things. So if you extrapolate all the way to the start of uh, extraction, you will see that it could be at least three meters of subsidence in the subsidence bowl. So that already should tell you that this is a large subsidence problem and probably infinitesimal strain models will not do justice, which we try to do here. This subsidence model is our uh, linear elastic infinitesimal strain model. We are trying to fit to the data, but um, without going into the detail, it was uh, it wasn't very satisfying. You know the properties we had to choose and the whole history we couldn't really capture it with the simple models. This one is a second example from Groningen uh, gas field again in Europe. Uh, so basically, just look at these two curves. You have a model curve and a data curve. Both are plotting uh, energy dissipated from uh, tiny micro seismic uh, events. So you can see the model is over predicting the energy, right? So it is above this curve, the data curve. So it is over predicting and that is a common uh, uh, byproduct or uh, limitation of these simple models, infinitesimal strain, linear elastic or even elastoplastic models because to, to match to, to this, part, this part of the curve where you have large energy release because of bigger events, more events, you have to bear with uh, this so you can only match you know one or the other the the higher nonlinearity in the data requires you to to go to complex models okay so i'll go through some equations uh, they could be tedious so i'll try to go through them fast because i know it's recorded so you can always refer to it later so finite strain versus infinitesimal strain theory 
So basically, the differences are as uh, are just three. So the three differences are, are are what I list here. First one is that we have to change from Cauchy stress, which is often denoted by stigma, to piola kirchhoff stress tensors, because what does finite strain mean? It means the strain is too much uh, compared to infinitesimal strain, which is very tiny, very small strain. So when you have too much deformation, too much strain, the deformed configuration after some time t is too different from the original undeformed or reference configuration. Since stress is defined from uh, force and uh, force acting on a area, surface area of the material, during this too much deformation, the area, surface area itself can change, rotate, uh, for example, that you have to use stress tensors which define these forces on reference area. The area, surface area has evolved during deformation and you want to use a stress tensor that is defined in terms of reference area because the whole equation of equilibrium is in terms of uh, reference configuration, right? Because deformation is given by your displacement uh, or positions at the cur current configuration or deformed configuration minus the initial. So you are tracking from reference. So your stresses have to be also defined with respect to the reference configuration. So that's why we have to use this uh, piola kirchhoff stresses. Second is the strain. The so strain is also different. Now we have large strain, so we cannot neglect this product of the derivatives, which is very small if you make infinitesimal strain assumption and that's why they drop. And that's why we use this, uh, that's how we can use the infinitesimal strain in small strain problems. And the third is that since it's a large deformation scenario, we work with the incremental quantities, you know, time rate of stress and time rate of strain instead of just stress and strain, which allows us to do linearization, linearization of uh, deformation steps. Okay, so going into the development of such a model and its application, this is a schematic of a, a typical scenario, right? Subsurface extraction, production induced deformation. <clears throat> and then you can take an REV like we did on the, on the previous slide and look at the kinematics as it's deforming. And you can start defining kinematic variables uh, such as uh, the deformation Jacobian in terms of determinant of uh, deformation gradient F and uh, all the quantities, quant physical quantities like density and porosity in terms of uh, uh, in the Lagrangian coordinate, coordinate right? Because now we are considering large deformation. So we have to distinguish between uh, Lagrangian and Eulerian in a, in a very clear manner. J here, the the determinant of f is no longer one or close to one. It could be very different from one. So we have to keep that distinction. Similarly, the mass is defined in terms of uh, uh, basically the Lagrangian porosity phi j. This is the Lagrangian mass of the fluid water and density. This one is the Eulerian uh, density. So you can also write it in terms of uh, Lagrangian and with the factor j. <clears throat> this is saturation. Okay, so system of governing equations. Again, we have the equilibrium equation as before in the infinitesimal strain, we had sigma. Now we have P, the piola kirchhoff stress, and we have to distinguish our spatial derivative operators like divergence here, whether it's with respect to the reference coordinate or uh, current coordinates. So we are, uh, when you write it like that, this is uh, with respect to the reference coordinate uh, system X. You can already see the coupling here. The so bulk density of the medium is given in terms of solid density and fluid densities, like in the two-phase case, water and gas densities. And uh, think about uh, the, the Lorca case I mentioned, you know, the extraction of water, uh, air replacing water in the pore space, that is leading to change in the saturation of gas, which is air and water. And you can see how that coupling will play a role in bulk density and thereby affect the equilibrium, the momentum balance. Okay, mass balance, we are very familiar with this. So we have one for each fluid phase, actually also for the solid phase, that is also important. That, that equation gives us the porosity evolution, evolution equation. 
If we have one for water, one for oil, one for gas, if you have three phase system, again, we have to distinguish since we are following the Lagrangian formulation, we have, and we have Lagrangian mass here, and these are Eulerian mass fluxes, Darcy fluxes, uh, and wells. We have this J factor here, Jacobian. And these are, these nablas are basically, you can see there is no subscript. So these are with respect to the current coordinates. So we have to make those distinctions between the two configurations. Uh, there are some intermediate steps in how you uh, close the system. You know, this is a common assumption. We decompose the deformation gradient in elastic and plastic parts. And similarly, the mass stored in the elastic pore space and plastic pore space. Because when you enter finite strain, it is very natural to talk about plasticity, right? You are talking about large deformation. So plasticity actually in real world shows up when you have large deformation, right? So you cannot really separate finite strain from plasticity. Uh, so that's why this, this thing uh, appears immediately. Uh, we already mentioned how, how we are going to use uh, the green Lagrange strain tensor, which uh, accounts for the derivative, the product of the derivatives of the displacement vector. Okay, so those were the governing equations. Constitutive equations are basically the equations of elasticity. The mass change is given by the change in uh, volumetric strain of the skeleton, porous skeleton, and change in fluid pressure, right? If you can inject, if you can store things at higher pressure, yeah, you can store more. Or if you can increase the pore space, you can store more. So this is how the pore elasticity equation can be understood. This uh, introduces uh, properties such as BO moduli and uh, BO coefficient here, denoted with B. So pore elasticity is one constitutive equation, then uh, effective stress is another constitutive equation. You can think of Terzaghi the effective stress. So you have to write that in the in the reference configuration again using the, the stress tensor S, which is basically related to P. P and S are Piola-Kirchhoff stress tensors. S and P are related uh, as, uh, as, as follows, P equal to uh, Fs. So deformation gradient actually relates the two stresses. So we write that. Uh, you notice the dot here, which I mentioned, uh, we are working with the uh, rate quantities because it's large deformation problem. And third constitutive equation is the stress strain relation. You always need that to capture the, the, the deformation of the material in terms of effective stresses. So this one here is the drained elasticity tensor, you know, which is basically composed of your Young's moduli, Poisson's ratio, and such. And then Darcy's law is also a type of constitutive equation for the flow problem. Uh, mass flux is given in terms of mobility, uh, phase mobility, the permeability, and the pressure gradient and buoyancy. Permeability here, again, since we have large deformation, we have to be careful and, uh, and use the appropriate relation in terms of deformation gradient and Jacobian. Okay, so that's all without the fault. Let's introduce the fault on which the seismic events are hosted and project the stresses on the fault. So you have a normal component, a shear component, and the fault has the inbuilt or inherent friction, which is opposing slip, shear slip uh, along the fault. And Coulomb failure criterion says that when the shear, the projected shear is greater than the friction, then the fault uh, may slip. And you can, you have, you may have seen this in the more Coulomb diagrams, this uh, more Coulomb circle diagrams, which show how injection leads to, you know, enlargement of the circle and how a point on the circle, which basically corresponds to a fault, touches the failure envelope, which is defined in terms of cohesion, friction angles, and when it touches, uh, that's when you have tau s equal to tau f. That is, you meet the criterion and the fault is likely to slip. Again, the tractions, shear and normal, you have to define in terms of these appropriate stresses in the finite strain. So looking at this criterion, you can just move tau f to the left-hand side and use the definition of tau f in terms of normal traction right, and define a quantity called Coulomb failure function on the left-hand side. When the CFF is greater than zero, then the fault will slip. That's what the criterion says. 
in reality in modeling studies since we don't know initial stresses very well we try to work with delta cff instead of cff and we say that okay when delta cff is positive there is a likelihood of slip we don't know whether cff is positive because we don't know the total value of the stress because we are uncertain about the initial point initial stress so we work with the change in stress change in cff and see if change is positive then we are good, getting close to the failure right so so we are going to, to look at some scenarios where change is positive and see how this relates to what we already know about induced seismicity so you can have four scenarios the shear increases that will lead to delta cff being positive the normal stress decreases you are trying to pull on the fault separate it out from the two surfaces or you inject uh, into the fault increasing its pressure all of that will lead to delta cff being greater than 0 and sometimes uh, lubrication of the fault uh, decrease in the friction coefficient so first mechanism this increase in shear is what happened in lorca you know we we, we drew water replaced water with air decrease in weight expansion of basement compression on the fault leading to when you project that compression in, along the fault you get additional shear and that was this mechanism of uh, induced seismicity at lorca this one here is the uh, extraction of oil and water from an oil field which is confined so this lorca thing was unconfined this is confined and here this contraction of the reservoir leads to pulling of the fault that is the the delta sigma n is is uh, Oh, I think the sign convention has flipped. Uh, I apologize. This one assumes compression is positive. This one assumes tension is positive. So, but they they are referring to the same thing. You are applying pull on the fault, which leads to delta CFF being positive. Third one is uh, the most common, uh, which I call the poster child of induced seismicity, because pressure rise leads to basically immediately. You can see how it dip, delta delta PF. being positive leads to delta cff being positive and this is a rare mechanism where uh, lubrication of fault can lead to uh, slip but more importantly it leads leads to leakage and that is relevant for co2 sequestration studies okay so i'll skip some of the details so we have tried to capture these in our modeling framework which has evolved over the years so there are details on the discretization of these variables pressure saturation displacement and fault tractions and if you listen to somik dana's talk a few weeks earlier he mentioned how we are extending this to two grid framework where you can have a grid for mechanics problem a grid for flow problem which are not the same grid which allows you to basically lets you have higher computational efficiency and speed of simulation okay this is the sequential solution strategy i will skip this and this is basically a slide showing all the features of the tool we have developed okay now it's application to a, a benchmark problem where finite strain can be appreciated So this is basically it's called strip footing problem you have a 2d domain and you're applying load on a strip of the top boundary just a fraction of the top boundary rest of the boundary is a uh, drained boundary so water can come out as this is being compressed and consolidated so we uh, performed infinitesimal strain and finite strain uh, simulations to see how the deformation is different on the surface and in the subsurface and what happens to the plastic failure uh how that is different between the two so the top row is uh, infinitesimal and the bottom row is finite strain model and there are some differences uh which you can look up uh, in detail in our recently published paper uh, by Xiao Shi Zhao but uh, the the point is that the two results differ and the difference start to diverge or increase as time goes on so that's why i mentioned earlier that long term loading problems uh, you have to be careful uh, if finite strain is applicable then you have to switch to that early on because in inelastic simulations the history is very important you cannot start anywhere and hope to capture the right information you have to start at the right point initial point and you have to capture the history the path of stress in time 
to be able to make accurate forecasts. We applied this uh, to the Groningen field, uh, which experienced many uh, micro seismic events. Uh, I think the biggest event was 3.6 or 3.8. Uh, this is an active gas field is still going on, uh, gas production is still going on. It has been studied by few people uh, because of its complexity, there are many, many faults, more than 100 faults, which are important, probably more uh, smaller faults. A uh, lot of uh, detail, a lot of history, uh, I guess uh, 50 years plus of production two-phase, three-phase problem, at least two-phase gas and water. Details on the production. So this is this is real real world, right? You cannot have a simple single vertical well and you know hope to capture a real world site like this. You have to honor the complexity in well position and placement and their flow schedule, which vary in time. So I'm just highlighting that with these details, which is the case in Groningen, uh, without going into much detail here. But yeah, so the maximum subsidence on the ground surface was 40 centimeter, which is, which is much smaller than Lorca, which was three meters, right? But still, this is a good candidate, can be a good candidate for uh, induced seismicity modeling because of the slide I showed earlier, if you remember, the discrepancy in the dissipated energy between model and simulation how I mentioned that model was over predicting and that was a infinitesimal strain model. So we are hypothesizing that by applying a finite strain model, we may get a better match between data and model and thereby improve uh, the accuracy of forecast, uh, forecasting events in future and also deformation and gas recovery, by the way. Okay, so these are some details of the geology which we need to capture the properties. Okay, I'll skip them. But this is our model, uh, which we are actually working on. It's a work in progress. So happy to share with uh, you, get your feedback. So there are many earthquakes recorded in this, in this area. We are considering the primary area, uh, which with most events and most uh, faults and most production. The model is complex right from the beginning. The mesh, you know, is uh, it's unstructured tetrahedral mesh, highly uh, non-uniform. You can see huge cells near the boundaries, but very fine cells near wells and the reservoir. Uh, more than half a million cells, 637,000 cells, 115 faults. Wells are complicated, as I mentioned. Uh, so after about, uh, 30 years of uh, 34 years of production the pressure change is highly compartmentalized you can see here in this figure because of the presence of so many faults uh, this one is showing displacement horizontal and vertical so subsidence is basically this last figure here vertical displacement and we are capturing the 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 the, the approximate value which is around 36 centimeters this is 33 centimeters maximum dis uh, subsidence. Also shown by this uh, displacement versus time plot. So 32 centimeters and 33 centimeters here. Yeah. Okay, so stresses, uh, which is very important for us, we analyze them in detail in all these compartments, how stresses are evolving, uh, in particular to see the effect of that on failure. So we are tracking shear failure, which is a proxy for fault slip uh, in this model at present. And we see that uh, basically we are able to capture the main earthquake events shown here on these faults uh, via this uh, proxy for shear failure, which is a function of the stress uh, on the faults, near the faults. Stresses are basically tracked uh, as their invariants. The first invariant captures the compression, tens tension, the volumetric response of the material. This, and the second invariant of deviatoric stress captures the devia deviatoric response, uh, for example, shear. Okay, so that ends the first uh, case study that I wanted to show. Uh, and. I apologize for going through this fast, but feel free to, 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 to ask questions. 
so next study that I wanted to share with you again, uh, very recent and uh, we are excited about this is basically the geomechanics of solid transport, which I listed in that simple complex, you know, table of simple and complex models. So what we are trying to understand is uh, what is the effect of, what is the coupling between geomechanics and solute transport governed by advection and dispersion processes. And a subtopic is that can we integrate existing models of fracture mechanics for elasticity and transport to, 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 to answer that question, to investigate that coupling between geomechanics and transport. Uh, well, the, yeah, this, this, is, this is well known, uh, you know, mixing and spreading is an open research problem in fracture reservoirs and especially in active transport when you have fingering like viscous fingering or, or density fingering. Uh, it is hypothesized that the coupling could be stronger because the coupling between flow and transport is very strong. Because it's uh, because it's hydrodynamically unstable, so we expect that that will lead to stronger coupling between transport and geomechanics. So this is the setup. We have uh, this fracture network. It's uh, motivated from a real uh, study. I forget the the location, but it was a real tracer study done in 2017. So we took the network uh, geometry from there and. What they did is uh, they did this push-pull test. So they pushed the tracer for some time and then they pulled, they withdrew the tracer. And this is the solute concentration versus time or breakthrough profile from that test. So we want to see how, what are the mechanisms that explain this and how, how we can capture some aspects of this uh, real data in such a setting. So we have this well here, the cyclic well, which uh, produces and injects and we are considering the viscosity contrast between the injected tracer fluid and the ambient uh, water. Hello, uh, I feel like my screen is frozen. Are you changing your slide, Virendra, or? Uh, my cursor is frozen. Okay, at least uh, the audio is going through, which is great. Yes, but sure. Yeah, I want to change my slide, but. Uh, okay, you could try to perhaps unshare and share maybe that would. Okay. Okay, my cursor is just a second. Sure. Yes, it looks like your your screen is is dynamic, so you could perhaps reshare again. I mean, go to full screen; it should work, hopefully. Okay. We lost our speaker uh, sorry. here. Yes, we lost the speaker. <laughs> Technical issues, uh, so uh, just bear with us. Um, I think it's the first first, first talk technical. in almost a year where we exactly. have some technical issues. Well, it's a live TV program, so what would you expect? So we should be better than other channels still. Uh, please think about good questions while the speaker is being back to the channel. Yes, he's back. So, welcome back, Birendra. Okay, thank you. Sorry, no problem. This this happened. Well, I think our audience just got lucky because Harin, I would have started singing very soon. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we should have some instruments ready. Oh, you don't want sing. to hear me singing. Um, <laughs> I think the viewers would go down from two thousand to zero very, very quickly. <laughs> Miranda, please. Miranda, okay. back to you. Okay, so 
So we were looking at this push-pull test in a fractured reservoir. And I mentioned that uh, besides the fracture complexity, uh, we are also considering uh, viscosity contrast between the injected fluid and the ambient fluid. So we can induce viscous fingering, right? So when we inject the less viscous tracer fluid in the more viscous ambient water, we will have viscous fingering. So we want to keep that uh, mechanism because we are interested in the in the hydrodynamically unstable transport through this fractured rock. That's the problem we defined, so that's why we do that. Uh, I already mentioned about this real data here. Okay. So again, without going into the detail, we have a system of governing equations, which is basically given by the mass balance. Then there is a momentum balance or equilibrium equation. And we have transport. That's the new part compared to the previous how this first half of the talk, you know, we have transport equations, advection, dispersion. And this, these are very standard equations. We have not uh, added any novel features here. We have taken this embedded uh, discrete fraction model, also known as EDFM, and Hadi is one of the experts. Uh, and we, we definitely benefited from his work and the work of other people in this community. So. You have equations for the matrix, equations for the fracture. For the equilibrium, we are assuming that matrix is the dominant part and fracture is equilibrated uh, instantaneously. It's not important for this problem. So we are only looking at equilibrium in the matrix. And uh, this slide here shows the coupling mechanisms, possible coupling pathways between different systems. So you have geomechanical system, we have fluid flow system, fracture mechanics, which basically modulates how fracture opens and slides uh, in response to stress changes. And then we have transport. That's the part we were uh, adding. And th these are the quantities variables going back and forth along uh, these coupling pathways. Viscosity, Darcy velocity, fracture aperture, uh, porosity, the strain rate, volumetric strain rate, and permeability. Okay, so what we did is we took this uh, existing fraction mechanics model uh, based on experiments known as Bandis model or Barton Bandis model. That is done, that has been proposed for elastic uh, uh, rocks, but in it doesn't really account for pore elasticity that well. So we extended that model to pore elasticity and at the same time, try to incorporate features to model hysteresis in fracture dilation. So when you, because we are doing push-pull, right? So you are, you can imagine that there is some kind of hysteresis. You are in, increasing stress, decreasing stress. You are opening fracture, closing fracture. So we are interested in modeling hysteresis because we believe that's a real uh, phenomenon. So we did that extension in the model and we capture shear induced dilation. Uh, because the original model is uh, heavily dominated by the normal dilation in, uh, due to normal uh, uh, opening and closing. So again, uh, without going into the equations too much, uh, mechanical aperture of the fracture is defined in terms of change in the normal aperture and the shear aperture, and they both can be derived from the original model and the properties of the joints or fractures. So J for joint, joint roughness coefficient, joint, uh, um, let me see, compressive strength, GC, JCS, and UCS is uniaxial compressive strength. So with those properties and these empirically based models and uh, extensions I mentioned, we were able to close the equations uh, so these are results of the simulation. These uh, dashed, line, dashed lines are showing the contours of concentration of this uh, tracer slug that is injected from this horizontal well, blue line here. And uh, time is going uh, from left to right, it's increasing. So at the end of injection period, when the tracer breaks through, which happens on the bottom boundary here, we have this snapshot. Then we have the soaking period where we inject the background fluid Right, so we inject a tracer, then we inject the background water for some time, 30 days actually. And then we withdraw the 
the tracer. We basically produce from the well and we get mostly tracers back, but we also get some, some of the background fluid. So this is 30 day into the withdrawal period. So you can see the contours, how they are going back and forth with hysteresis, right? It's not completely reversible process because of the presence of fractures and other mechanisms of hysteresis. So if you plot the concentration at the well as a function of time, you will have some profile and you'll start to see features and start to find interesting results. Uh, and we looked at how the results are actually different at different locations in the well, which makes sense because at different points in the well, the, the, the fracture morphology is different. Number of fractures intersecting the well, the orientation, et cetera, are different. So that is expected, but one thing we noticed is that uh, the curve, this uh, concentration versus time curve can be used to estimate fracture morphology uh, as if uh, uh, similar to reservoir characterization, right? And this, is, this has been mentioned in the literature, but this is a very special case showing that it can be done. Based on the curve, if we measure such a curve in, in, at a site, we can use it to estimate fracture density, orientation, and permeability because they look very different in the withdrawal phase, which allows us to, to, to go over signal to noise, uh, basically beyond the noise in the data and distinguish the curves to, 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 to get the morphology of the fractures. Okay, this is showing how the Rotation in principal stress directions, basically a geomechanical effect, is linked to transport because transport is heterogeneous now because of the presence of fractures. The geomechanical changes are also heterogeneous. In particular, it's compartmentalized in four compartments. Uh, and here we are looking at the rotation of the principal stress, maximum principal stress, which is an important quantity. If you have to drill a new well, you want to know how the principal stress is oriented because that will determine how many fractures you will intersect if you're going to do hydraulic fracturing, you also need to know the principal stress direction. Uh, more detailed analysis, uh, basically looking at the effect of viscosity contrast, this viscous fingering effect basically, right? That's the active transport mechanism. So if we increase the viscosity contrast between tracer and water, does it have any influence on geomechanical properties such as you know, stress invariants, uh, the, the, the first invariant, the second invariant, and the answer is yes. Answer is yes. It is a weak response uh, and it depends on the contrast in viscosity or in other words, the strength of coupling between flow and transport. But yes, there is coupling between geomechanical parameters, stresses and degree of mixing here, which is the zeta and the mean concentration of the solute, which I believe is a novel result. Uh, and uh, so this is still under investigation to see how we can capture or quantify these uh, couplings between transport and geomechanics. This result here is on the geomechanical stability of fractures, which was another goal. Uh, if you remember the, the, the question we posed to ourselves, uh, can we use existing models to, to tell us something about geomechanical stability of fractures during the transport? So this basically uses the Mohr circle uh, diagram to see how individual fractures uh, get closer to the failure envelope during injection or withdrawal and, and what drives that uh, movement. So I won't go into the detail here, but it will be available in the paper. All right, so conclusions. Finite strain deformation models are required to explain and predict induced deformation at some sites. And the error between the finite and infinitesimal models grow with time. Advection dominated transport in fracture reservoirs shows strong coupling to geomechanical processes and therefore cannot be neglected. And an overarching conclusion is that computational geomechanics is a powerful tool to understand, predict, and control flow induced deformation. With that, thank you everyone and look forward to a few questions. Thanks a lot, Birendra, for this fantastic presentation and quite comprehensive uh, development. Uh, Really enjoyed this this uh, interesting talk. We have plenty of questions posted, and we are reaching the time limit. Sebastian is now ready to just kick off with the questions. So please, Sebastian, I have plenty myself, but there is no need for for us to ask questions. Time. 
Yes, so thank you very much um, for a great talk, really interesting talk, Virendra, and um, fantastic details then, fantastic detail to the science that you're um, doing there. I start with Christine's question because she picks up on, on um, your first conclusion point where you said that the error growth use um, infinitesimal strain models um, instead of a finite strain model. You mentioned earlier on in your talk that getting the starting point is right. And Christine asked, and thanks for the great talk, you mentioned that it is important to get the initial point right in your simulation so to know the history um, to make the right predictions. Do you have any advice on how to choose this? How far do we need to get back in time or rephrasing the question or how can we capture and mitigate the uncertainty that is used by picking perhaps the wrong initial point? Hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, so how far to go in the past to capture the, to, to define the initial point so we can be accurate in our predictions of the future? That is hard to answer, at least for me. Uh, of course, I mean, the short answer, a naive answer would be you go to the initial point, meaning uh, you go to the reservoir uh, before it was perturbed. So the reservoir is under equilibrium uh, with tectonic forces and hydrostatics, um, whatever it is, overpressured or uh, perfectly hydrostatic, it is under equilibrium uh, millions of years. So if you can, if you know at what point in time that was perturbed by drilling a well into it, starting production injection, that will be the right time to start your initial, to define your initial state. The problem often is not that we don't know that time. In all fields, we know when the thing, uh, when the production began, began. Problem is to estimate the initial stresses at that point in time. And I don't have a, a good answer to that. It is, a, it is highly uncertain. And the only way we handle this in real world studies is to make it an uncertain variable within a range. For example, you know, horizontal to vertical stress ratio, we say, okay, it's a, reverse faulting regime, which you can be pretty certain about based on the past earthquakes or world stress map. And then that tells you it's greater than one or less than one, that ratio. And then you choose a few values in that range from, let's say if it's a thrust faulting or reverse faulting, then you choose 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, because you have a range from the entire world, uh, reverse faulting the sites in the world. And then you run simulations for each of those possible scenarios and you capture the output and you basically report your outputs as, uh, as, as, as estimates or forecasts within that range with a, with a bound of uncertainty. So, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, you cannot really estimate the initial values uh, with certainty using what I mentioned here, because I'm, I'm not even actually going there. I'm saying that once you choose a value, you should be, you should pay attention to the models you are using. So you don't lose what um, efforts you put in estimating the initial values. You should use the finite strain model or plastic models when, uh, when you can. So at least the initial stresses are projected in time carefully and the uncertainty in the initial values, you capture that by doing a sensitivity analysis where you have multiple such values and you run multiple simulations. Okay, thank you. So this brings me nicely to the next point um, that Alex Novikov is wondering, we're asking, thank you. And says, thank you, Professor. Ja. Performance can limit the use of sophistic more sophisticated models, finite strains, in elastic models in the context of inverse modeling and uncertainty quantifications. Uh, which solver schemes are the best for the performance in your particular framework? Which solvers uh, did best in our framework? Is that yeah. Uh, okay? Yeah. So, I mean, I I am assuming by solver. Uh, uh, Alex, you mean uh, linear solvers? I, I uh, would yeah, guess the same. Yes. Yes, the linear okay. solvers. I think. Uh, okay. I mean, I will. I will. Yeah, I will give some information, but I'm not sure if I will be answering the question. Uh, but okay, here is what we use. So, 
for the mechanics, we use uh, the, the solvers in the PETC suite of uh, uh, solvers, you know, portable extensible toolkit for scientific computing and open source toolkit. It has a bunch of solvers, linear and nonlinear uh, solvers. We use iterative solvers and there we use uh, uh, basically uh, adaptive swash method, ASM type of uh, uh, methods and we use preconditioner. Uh, the other point I want to mention is that when you include faults, you may create the saddle point problem because the way we are solving for faults, dynamic fault slip is that we have Lagrange multipliers or tractions on the fault as part of the unknown vector linear system. That gives rise to a saddle point problem. So we have to use customized preconditioners and that detail is uh, there in the paper. Uh, our tool is called Pilot and it is under active development by group of developers and they have a paper where they discuss the performance of different types of solvers from PETC suite. On the flow side, we use uh, adaptive multigrade. We have used other uh, CPA, other other solvers also, but AMG is what is uh, we are using these days, and it's performing very well. Uh, offered by Fraunhofer Institute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So staying on the topic of sort of inverse modeling and, and the challenge of getting the right data into the models. Um, Leila asks, um, and thank you for the interesting talk. talk. Did you consider the heterogeneity in rock properties, permeability, elastic plastic properties in the groaning and field study? Yes, so uh, that is, uh, uh, yes, so uh, not quite, no. The model that I discussed or showed it is using layer-wise heterogeneity. So I'll go quickly if I can find that slide, which I skipped through very fast. Yeah, here. So we have layer-wise properties, but not really uh, heterogeneity in space, lateral, laterally mm -hmm. speaking, you know, in X and Y, we have variation by layer in the Z direction. So bulk modulus, Young's modulus, uh, cohesion on the weak planes, the faults basically, and friction angle. In fact, actually, you can see some of them are very similar. So the model that I showed, it is limited in that sense, primarily okay. because we couldn't find the data, and also because our focus was to look at the effect of um, finite strain in, what is the effect of finite strain on predicting the failure onset time and magnitude compared to an infinitesimal strain simulation. If you add heterogeneity, all of a sudden things become hard to understand because a change could be due to heterogeneity or could be due to difference in the model, finite versus infinitesimal. So to, to, to avoid ambiguity, we try to keep things simple in the property properties. And uh, yeah, that was the reason. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm realizing we're running out of time. So I'm going to take one final question from Florian and not the one where, it's here, where we were hoping that um, you drop out again so you can hear Hardy and myself singing. Um, I'm talking, taking the scientific question, Florian. Um, so thank you for the very interesting talk, Virendra. Whenever I come across the transformation from Olearian to Lagrangian with respect to flow, I was wondering whether there's something intuitive to be learned. What would you what would you do miss if you express Darcy in Eulerian instead of Lagrangian coordinates or vice versa? What would you miss if we use one versus the other, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm. That is a, a bit generic question. I will try to uh, answer based on what I understood from the question. So the Physical intuition is that uh, Lagrangian is uh, a formulation it allows you to track changes in your state variables, could be fluid mass, could be uh, displacement, stress, strain from a reference point. And that reference point is you know, almost always initial time step, initial time when things are undeformed and under equilibrium. Eulerian 
does not uh, allow you to do that at least not easily so lagrangian is so that's the physical intuition if you have a need to track things in time from a reference point then lagrangian is the way to go it's the natural choice because all the quantities are defined with respect to a reference point like stresses i mentioned a mass i mentioned you know uh, so the equations themselves become sim- simpler and the the understanding of the results from the equations becomes simpler the derivation is involved but fortunately that does not go into the into the simulator part or the coding part you know equations have to be derived outside the simulator and that requires uh, some some tensor algebra if you are going lagrangian route but once you have the equations it is simpler and it has this physical intuition that you are tracking the mass at any point in time from your simulation is the mass with respect to a reference point any change in mass is with respect to that reference point so you can understand it that way same thing with stress uh, and strain so if you miss or if you use one versus the other uh, that is totally fine they are both equivalent representations eulerian and lagrangian but very very clearly one is easier to understand and explain than the other de- depending on the problem so for flow problems you may know uh, florian uh, olerian is a very common way to do things because we in the lab in the field we actually measure things in olerian sense we take a snapshot so we have variations in space and fluid particles are changing moving so fast that it is kind of fruitless to have a reference point and track from there it just becomes too much uh without uh too much displacement without any gain but for solid deformation lagrangian makes sense because deformations are much smaller than fluid and uh, that's how it's understood and reported in the in the in the data so so lagrangian for f- solid and olerian for fluid but if you are going into finite deformation where the solid deformation is also large you could skip to olerian for both solid and fluid or you could use lagrangian which is what i showed you bring fluid to lagrangian and solid is of course lagrangian uh, formulation and that is just uh, the equations are easier to there are easier equations that result for the for the simulator to solve so that's why we we choose that but mathematically both representations are equivalent so thank you very much we well over time no so I do apologize if i couldn't take all the um questions from from the audience um thank you again birendra for a really great talk really um i think it's a fantastic study um that you've shown there series of studies great model f- modeling framework that you have um, developed so thank you for that thank you for taking the time to answer all the questions and thank you to the audience for asking the questions again apologize apologies that i couldn't put all the questions forward hadi over to you yes thank you very much so i'd like to uh, take the chance and announce our uh, next speaker will be uh, anna suzuki professor anna suzuki from tohoku university our first uh, keynote speaker from japan We are so excited to host her in our channel next week, the same time, 4 p.m. Uh, Central European, 3 p.m. Uh, British time. And uh, the title, the subject of the lecture of Anna will be about uh, fracture networks and community networks for co-creation of geothermal resources utilization. So until next week, the same time, please stay happy, healthy, and tuned in to our channel. and we see you all again next week with another geoscience and geoenergy webinar thank you very much birendra it was our pleasure and honor to host you stay well thank you thank bye you bye. everyone thank you bye bye